Well, today, in, at the end of this service, we're going to be baptizing, uh, it's very exciting, 33 people. And um, I always say that baptism is not the uh, end of the Christian journey, it's the starting line. And um, once you're baptized, you're saying, I'm following Christ, I want to live like him. So it's quite appropriate that today we're starting our sermon series looking at the Sermon on the Mount. Now this is the greatest sermon ever preached. Well, I don't mean this sermon I'm about to preach to you. That is definitely not the greatest sermon ever preached. But Jesus' Sermon on the Mount was the greatest sermon ever preached because here he shows us how to conduct our lives. Uh, We're told uh, at the beginning of Matthew chapter five at the start of his sermon that Jesus gave the sermon on a mountainside. This is quite uh, significant because in the Old Testament, um, God had given the law through Moses that established the old covenant when Moses was up a mountain. So here on this mountainside, Jesus is not so much laying down a new law, replacing the old covenant, rather he shows us how to live out the Christian life. And what we see in this sermon, Matthew chapters five to seven, is that actually it's pretty much impossible to do without the help of the Holy Spirit, but with the Holy Spirit, it becomes not a chore, but a pleasure and a joy. And he begins, we we see at the start of uh, chapter five, just preaching to his disciples, a small group of ordinary people. But by the time you get to the end of chapter seven in Matthew's gospel, we're told the whole crowd had gathered to hear. So this teaching is relevant to everyone. Wherever you see yourself in your spiritual journey, maybe you're not yet a Christian, or maybe you've been a Christian all your life, this is for you. This teaching is for everyone. And it's a challenge. I mean, do you like a challenge? Are you up for it? Because if so, these are the most challenging words ever spoken. But Jesus says at the end of the sermon in Matthew 7, that the person who hears his teaching, and takes up the challenge of living this way, that person is wise. So we're going to start at the beginning. It's uh, Matthew chapter five, verses one to 12, and it begins with these words of Jesus, which are known as the Beatitudes. So let's start. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside, and he sat down. Now, when a rabbi sat down, it meant that he was about to say something of huge significance. Today, when we teach, we want to stand up. But back then, it was the opposite. They sat down, which I think is very sensible. (laughs) His disciples came to him. So it was just the disciples at first. And he began to teach them. There, that word means he sort of opened up his heart to them. And Jesus said this. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus says here at the start of this remarkable sermon, 
that what matters most in life is not what you have nor what you do, but who you are. And he starts with these beatitudes. Think of them as the be attitudes or the beautiful attitudes. And he uses this word blessed a lot, as you'll notice. To be blessed conveys happiness, but it's far more than that. Happiness is subjective and circumstantial. But to be blessed means to be blessed by God. It's to live under the favor of God. So Jesus is showing us here how to live under God's blessing and favor. And he begins by answering this question. What sort of people should we be? And his answer is given in eight steps. The first four steps describe uh, our sort of character and relationship before God. The second four steps describe our relationship with others and the world around us. So we're going to zip through all eight Beatitudes in one pow, 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 go. Are you ready? I'm going to have a drink for energy. Okay, how do we live? Step one, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In Greek, which is uh, the New Testament was written in Koine Greek, in Greek there are two words for poor. The first means lacking in wealth and therefore needing to work. That's not the word used here. The second word for poor, which is the one used here, means to be in such a desperate state of poverty that you're dependent on others for support. So to be poor in spirit is sort of the opposite of spiritual pride. It's realizing that we need God's help because we can't do it alone. It's the opposite of saying, actually, I'll be all right because I've led a morally good life. That's how I used to think. I remember when I'd, I'd not been a Christian very long, I was talking with a guy who'd been a Christian for many, many years. And I was saying to him how easy I thought the Christian life was. I, thought, I said to him, I think I've got it just about nailed. And he said to me, oh, have you heard of being poor in spirit? Which I hadn't. It means to recognize how far short we fall, not of other people's standards, but of God's standards, and to therefore throw ourselves on the mercy of God because we can't justify ourselves. And Jesus says that those who do that and recognize their desperate need, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, he says, ah, oh, welcome to my kingdom. So if you're here today and you're feeling spiritually desperate, or maybe you're just feeling a complete failure in life, then funnily enough, you're in the right place. Because Jesus goes, okay, now you can enter my kingdom. You're in my kingdom. Be encouraged. Step two. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. The word mourn means to be sad or grieve. And it's a mistake to think that Christians should never be happy. Joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. But it's also a mistake to think that Christians somehow should never be sad. Ecclesiastes 3 says, there's a time for everything. So it's healthy, say, to weep over the loss of a loved one. Jesus wept when he heard that his friend Lazarus had died. It's also healthy to weep over the state of the mess we see around us. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. But, funnily enough, this is not the type of mourning that Jesus is talking about here. Rather, it's linked to the first beatitude. It's a weeping at our own poverty of spirit and being brokenhearted about it. And the Holy Spirit often brings a godly grief. 
often at the point of conversion, when we weep tears of repentance, but also maybe later on when we are a Christian, if we then slip up and we sin or we mess up, we might weep then as we repent. And sometimes uh, we see this in scripture. So Peter, the apostle Peter, when he realized how much he'd messed up in denying Jesus before the crucifixion, we read that he wept. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, there's often tears. Sometimes it's weeping over past sins, but sometimes it's also tears as we heal from past hurts. The book of Revelation says that every tear is captured. It's powerful. It brings healing. When um, I was at university, I hadn't been a Christian very long, and I went to a a Christian student gathering one evening. And I walked in, I was slightly late, and the worship was playing. And the presence of the Spirit of God in the room was so tangible, I did something that I'd not done since I was a little boy. I began to cry for the first time. Now, it's really hard to believe this, but back then, I was quite macho. Um, I, yeah, I'm a bit upset by the disbelief on some people's faces. here. Um, you know, I, 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 I fought on the university karate team. I used to train with the university boxing team. I always wore a, um, a leather biker jacket. I had long hair back then, which was quite cool. Now any sort of hair would be a blessing. (laughs) And these tears were not in fitting or helpful for my image, so I thought. So what I did was I thought, I can't have anybody see me. So I just turned around and I walked back outside into the um, cold air outside and I I began to um, dry my tears and I thought, come on, Miles pull yourself together, and then I walk back into the room. But again, the minute I walked into the presence of God, I began to tear all over again. But this time, somebody saw it. <laughs> and he walked over me and said, Miles, are you, are you all right? And I said, I think it's some sort of allergic reaction to something. <laughs> um, it wasn't an allergy. <laughs> In my heart, I somehow knew what it was. I was weeping over my own sinfulness, my my spiritual bankruptcy. But I, I was also weeping healing tears, tears that the Spirit used as he began to heal past hurts in me. Jesus says that when we mourn in this way over our spiritual bankruptcy. He says, we will be comforted. The Holy Spirit is known as the comforter. And I want to encourage you, if you are feeling broken and you're mourning today, the Holy Spirit can heal and bring those tears from tears of sadness to tears of joy. Third step, Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, meek is not a word we use very often. Meek does not mean weak. Rather, it means to be gentle, uh, considerate, unassuming. It means to be broken in the sense that a wild horse is broken in when it's tamed. So meekness is not weakness, rather it is harnessed strength. In Numbers chapter 12, we're told that Moses was the the most meek person alive. And yet we also know that he was a very strong and successful leader. So it's about being undefended as a person, not worrying about what others think. As John Bunyan said, he that is down need fear, no fall. Psalm 37 tells us that the meek will inherit the land. But here Jesus goes further and says the meek will inherit the earth. What does that mean? 
Well, what he's saying is that everything that we now receive, we will view it as a gift because we now realize we don't deserve any of it. Everything, all good things come from God and we see it as a gift because we know we don't deserve it. And suddenly that means that life goes from this is what's due to me, this is my right, to life is just one gift after another after another. In that sense, we inherit the earth. This truly is a blessing. Step four, Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Do you know, if you're really hungry or really thirsty, it becomes all-consuming. You can't think of anything else. I don't just mean, oh, what time's lunch? But when you're really hungry, really thirsty, I once had the unfortunate experience of being stuck with um, two other friends, so three of us, on foot in the middle of a desert in Central Asia when a sandstorm hit. It's a long story, I can tell you another time. It's not a normal situation to be in. But all we could do was out of our bags, pull out shirts, literally wrap it around our face like a mummy, and we'd hunker down back to back, and you just had to sit it out for one hour. What I hadn't realized about a sandstorm is, not only is it quite terrifying and disorientating, it's extremely hot. And I felt every tiny last bit of moisture from my mouth evaporating. My, my mouth became so dry, my tongue sort of swelled a little. At the end, I, I couldn't talk. But all I could think about was a glass of water. You could have offered me anything in the world at that point, and I would have forgone it all just to get water. That is real thirst. And Jesus says we're to have this same longing, the same attitude towards righteousness, desiring to live in a right relationship with God. That's what righteousness means. And to see to desire to see his righteousness played out in society. Now, the word for righteousness here is in the accusative case in the Greek, not in the genitive. So what, you might say. Well, let me illustrate this. Uh, about a week and a bit ago, Sarah made some, she baked some brownies. Sarah's brownies are very good, I have to tell you. But she made, left, made the mistake of leaving them out on the kitchen surface. So I thought, you know, I'll, I'll take one for the team and I better quality control one of these big brownies just to make sure they're fit for the family. So I sliced an edge off the brownie. I tried, tried it and thought, oh, that's good. Um, but I better just check, it, it, it's, it's good. So I took a bit more and then I thought, oh, that's, you know, about a quarter gone. You never leave three quarters of a brownie, right? Maybe half, somebody might want half. So I, I cut it down the middle and I, and I ate the rest. Then I thought, oh, but I wonder if the other half is cooked as well as the other first half. <laughs> I better check, so I, I took a little bit more off. And then I thought, but that's odd, that's now less than half a brownie. Nobody wants to eat less than half a brownie. <laughs> I ate the whole lot. If it had been in the genitive case, it would mean to desire partial righteousness. It would be like having just that first little sliver of the brownie. But because this is written in the accusative, it means that we're to desire righteousness in its entirety. We want the whole spiritual brownie. This is what it means to be a Christian. We don't live compartmentalized, sliced up lives. Rather, we live integrated, 24-7 lives. But the problem is, sometimes we're not that desperate to change, are we? Or we know some of the implications or consequences that change will mean. Or, or maybe it's because, if we're honest, we're just not that hungry or thirsty for righteousness. But the wonderful thing is that today, 
we can pray and you can ask God to give you that hunger and that thirst. And God says when we're desperate to be righteous, to live differently, then God will fill our desire for righteousness and we will be satisfied. Okay, so that's the first four Beatitudes, our relationship with God described. But it was Martin Luther King who said, a person has not started living until they can rise above the narrow confines of their own existence to the broader concerns of all humanity. You know, we tend to think that to have influence beyond ourselves, we need position, we need power, we need wealth. But Jesus says to his disciples, who were just a small group of ordinary people, he said, you live like this, you can influence the whole world. Simply by who you are. So, the next four steps look at our relationship with others, with the world. What are they? Okay. Step five. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Now, to be merciful has two connotations. The first one is to be merciful to those in need. A bit like the Good Samaritan in the parable that Jesus told. In this case, our mercy will lead to us practically helping those who are hungry or, let's say, lonely or sick. Uh, A few years back, I was on the London Underground, the, um, the underground train network called the Tube. And I got on to the train at my station, and there was one seat left available, so I I sat down in it. At the next stop, a whole load of people got on who now had to stand in the aisleway, including one old lady, an old auntie. And she came and sort of stood holding the handrail right in front of me. So I thought, okay, I better do the right thing and offer her my seat. So I started to get up and say, would you like to have my seat? And the auntie said, oh, no, 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 sit down, dear. You need it more than me. I thought, well, that's a weird thing to say. Why is she saying that? Well, we continued on our journey, and a little bit later, I sort of happened to look over my shoulder, and suddenly, I hadn't seen it before, but I saw there was a sign just above my seat, which said, this is a priority seat for those who are pregnant, (laughs) disabled, or sick. So I thought, well, she probably doesn't think I'm pregnant, so she probably thinks I'm really unwell. So I I sat there thinking, what do I do? Do I explain? By which time, I could see my uh, stop was approaching. So I started to get out of my seat, at which point this auntie, clearly wanting to be merciful, decided I needed help. So this huge stack of people standing in the aisleway, she started saying, uh, make way for him, clear the way, he's coming, make way, let... I'm thinking, oh no, they're all looking at me thinking, who is this guy? So I stood up and went, oh. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, and I got off the train and she was peering through the window. I thought, please leave, train leave. <laughs> So I continued on the platform, waving, and then as soon as it was gone, it was a miracle, I was healed. (laughs) She was trying to be (laughs) merciful. But there's a second way in which we can be merciful, and this is harder. It's to be merciful to those who have wronged us. Mercy is a divine quality. It's a characteristic of God himself. And Jesus says those who show mercy will receive mercy. Now, it's not a transaction. We don't earn it. But the fact that we can forgive is evidence that we have already been forgiven by God ourselves. This is what Luke chapter 7 is all about. Now, it's not a bargain with God, but it's a virtuous circle. And when we realize how much God has forgiven you and me, when you realize that, then we can't fail to have mercy on others. Step six, 
Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. We learn from Mark chapter seven that Jesus is much more concerned about the inward and the moral than the outward or the ceremonial. And pure means to be unmixed, unadulterated. The pressure from the world is to conform. But to be pure in heart means to be free from that pressure. It means you don't have to pretend. You can take off the mask. We can just be ourselves, sincere in our relationships. We realize, as Pastor Benny Ho put it at LC18, that we've got nothing to lose, nothing to prove, and nothing to hide. This is freedom. This is purity of heart. And Jesus promises that God will reveal himself to us and to people like this. Deception blinds us, but honesty and purity opens our eyes to God. Step seven, Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. A peacemaker desires to bring blessing to other people, because so many people, they're not at peace. They don't know inner peace, maybe they don't know peace with God, or they're not at peace with others. But Jesus says, if we bring peace to them, we'll be called children of God. In other words, we'll bear the family likeness of God the Father because he is the ultimate peacemaker. Romans 5.1 says that through the cross, God made it possible for us to have peace with him. In 2 Corinthians 5, St. Paul says that now our role is to be ambassadors for Christ, bringing reconciliation to a divided world. And the Holy Spirit always brings reconciliation and unity. I was really blessed this past week to hear from this woman called Serene. She lives in KK, and she described how over the last nine years, she's consistently been running alpha in her workplace. And when we asked her what, what's been the fruit of that, she gave two examples. One was one of the many people who came to faith on these alpha runs in her workplace was a guy who then became her husband, so that was quite an impact. But more than that, she said, it's totally changed the culture of the company. She said, we used to have lo lots of infighting between departments and even within departments. But she said, now there's such a sense of togetherness in the company. It's the power of love. She was sent as a peacemaker into that company, a child of God. And then step eight, the final step, Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now we might think, wow, if we live like this, we are gonna be universally popular, right? Wrong. <laughs> Jesus never guaranteed popularity. Actually, in one sense, if we live like this, we become the conscience of humanity, and that's not always popular. But Jesus said, look, you don't have to go looking for persecution. You know, don't go out for lunch after this and say, I'm here, please persecute me. But he said, if it comes, then you're to regard it as a blessing. He says in verse 12, rejoice and be glad. Why? Well, Jesus gives us three reasons why. Verse 12, he says, because of your future reward in heaven. Second reason, he says in verse 11, the joy comes from identifying with Jesus and his suffering by being persecuted because of him. And thirdly, verse 12, he says it's a sign, if you're persecuted, that your faith is genuine because the prophets were persecuted in the same way. Back in 1995, I had the privilege of um, visiting and meeting in uh, Guangzhou, uh, one of the heroes of the house church movement in China, a man called Lam Musa, Pastor Lam. Amazing man. And he described to me how his house church had grown to about 300 in size when the first wave of persecution came, and he was thrown in prison. 
And when he came out of prison, to his surprise, the church had doubled in size to 600. Then it stayed at 600, and a second wave of persecution came. They beat him up, they threw him in prison. When he came out, it had grown to 900. And then a third wave of persecution. Again, more time in prison. When he was released, it was 1,600 in size. And at the end of this very moving conversation, as I was about to leave, he said, so, Miles, from now on, I will pray that you too know the blessing of persecution. <laughs> I said, I'm sure you're a very busy man. <laughs> there are much more important things to pray about. Thank you very much. <laughs> Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Now, these eight Beatitudes are a coherent whole. They're not an a la carte menu to choose from. I'll have number two and number five, please. They're a whole, and we know this because the writer Matthew uses a literary device called an inclusio to show us this. Notice how the first beatitude, those who are poor in spirit, and the last beatitude, beatitude those who are persecuted, if, if they both finish with the same words, for theirs are the kingdom of heaven. It's, they're like two bookends to say this is a whole teaching. And these eight steps can be summarized as follows. Cry out to God, O oh Lord, have mercy. Weep over your condition. Be so broken that you can accept any criticism and feedback. Be desperate not only about the past, but longing to do something about the future. Know your need and therefore be merciful to others. Be completely open in all your relationships. Bless others in every possible way and, accept, and expect nothing in return except perhaps persecution. And Jesus says to that small group of ordinary people he called disciples, he said, if you live like this, you'll have an enormous influence on the whole world. And they did. We're here as proof of that. The question is, will we have an influence on the world when we live like this? Amen? Would you just bow your head? I'm just going to pray briefly and we're just going to ask the Spirit of the Lord to come now and empower us to live this radically distinctive life that our character would be like the character of Christ. So, Lord God, we confess how far short we fall of your standards but thank you that you loved us so much that you came and did something about it. We are so thankful. And we declare that we desperately need you to make us right with our heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord. We accept your forgiveness right now. Help us to be people who also show mercy and forgiveness to others and Lord we can't live this way in our own strength we need the empowering of your Holy Spirit so come Holy Spirit would you fill us now fill us we pray to be peacemakers in our workplace and family to be pure in heart honest and open in our relationships, to show mercy to others, and to expect nothing in return, regardless of the consequence. Help us to be your ambassadors. Burn away the impurities in our life. May we shine for you, Lord Jesus. And I just want to pray, if you're here today and you, you are mourning, you're feeling just terrible about whatever it might be in life. 
May you know the comfort of the Spirit right now, the one who calls alongside you, the comforter. And may the peace of God that goes beyond all understanding keep your heart and your mind in the love of Christ Jesus now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.